Is your business leaving you feeling overwhelmed with the enormous amount of tasks at hand that you have to do, all of the things that you have to accomplish, the processes you have to fix, the processes you have to put in place? Is it just leaving you feeling like it's impossible to get everything done that you need to do to accomplish your goals? If that's how you're feeling, then this is the module for you. We're going to talk about marginal gains today and how you can use small incremental improvements to achieve great results. And we're gonna do it right now. Welcome back to another module on continuous improvement. And today we're gonna to talk about marginal gains and how just small improvements can yield big results. I want you to look at the graph on my screen. This is a graph showing how small incremental improvements, just 1% day after day, week after week, doesn't look like much at the beginning, but over time, it dramatically increases your performance. Same thing in the opposite direction, of course, as well. If you get 1% worse every day or week over time, that's going to compound into something that isn't good. But we're going to talk about the positive side today. How do we use small incremental gains or marginal gains to our benefit? Well, this is a story about a team from Britain, the cycling team from Britain specifically called Team Sky. Team Sky had a problem. They were terrible. Literally the worst cycling team in the world, or at least many thought so. They hadn't won a Tour de France in 110 years. They had only won one gold medal in the Olympics, and they were so bad that one of the manufacturers actually asked them not to ride their bicycles. If you can imagine that, just being so bad, they're like, please, you know, don't don't ride our bikes. We don't want to be seen on them. So enter a man named David Brailsford, and he was hired to take over the cycling team and, you know, get them performing, get them to win some races. And what would you do if you were in this environment? You'd just been made the CEO of this company and they were struggling. They're doing a terrible job what would your first reaction be? Well, hopefully, you know, you would look at the business and say, hmm, what can we do with this? What can we do to make better? But a lot of people would probably just say, okay, clean slate, let's wipe everybody out, let's start over, start fresh, you know, get the right players on the bus, uh, so to speak. And, and luckily, fortunately for all of us, uh, David Brailsford did not do that. He looked at his team, the coaches, um, you know, the, the technicians, everything in the system, and he said, you know what? I think we have some pretty good stuff here. I think if we can just start to change a few things, we will start to get better results. Interesting idea, right? Would you be gutsy enough to do that if you were put in charge? So his goal was, we're going to win the Tour de France within five years. And that was it. He's going to rally his troops around this one big goal that everybody wants to accomplish. So how do you do that? you start by experimenting. So he started experimenting and learning all these things that other professional teams already do, already knew. He started gathering knowledge from all over, not just his industry, not just cycling, but around the world. So for example, he brought in some physicians and said, hey, how do we keep our team from getting sick? Because if they wake up with a stuffy nose and they're a little you know, drowsy, whatever, they can't perform. So he had a physician come in, teach them how to wash their hands, you know, scrub all the way up to your elbows, and, uh, you know, two weeks before every uh, uh, competition, he'd say no shaking hands with anybody, just no, no touching people, stay free of germs. And this was pre-COVID, right? This was before 2020 and uh, before all of us learned how to, you know, properly wash our hands and it became common knowledge. So this was a big deal. Then he said, look, who else in the world has to wake up in a different city every day and perform at a really high level? Because that's what we're doing. Well, the Russian ballet, of course, they're the best in the world. They wake up in a new city every day and have to perform at this incredibly high level. So he asked them, what is it that you guys do to perform so well? And they said, well, one of the things we do is we bring our bedding with us. So when our team goes to sleep at night, they're smelling their own smell, sleeping on their own pillow. They're not waking up with a crink in their neck because, you know, they, they slept wrong, right? So just that small change, David Brailsford said, okay, we can do that. We can bring our bedding. We can bring our pillows with us. That, that's a small 1% improvement that we can make. Let's, why not? Let's give it a go. He painted the inside of the van where they carry their bicycles white, bright white, put great lighting in there. Why? Well, because then you can see dirt's on, dirt on the bikes. You can see if there's anything wrong mechanically, if there's parts on the floor, right? If anything's wrong, you can visibly see it. So this is just great visual management. And, you know, he probably wasn't a student of lean manufacturing, 
Um, but this is for those of you that are in lean manufacturing, lean operations, you understand very much the concept of visual management and good 5S or 6S. Other things he did, redesigned the bike seats to make them more comfortable, um, put alcohol on the tires to get better grip, you know, trying to find new formulations for the tires. Um, he had the, the riders wear electric bike shorts so they could keep their muscles at the right temperature at all times of the day and all temperatures. Um, he actually tested various fabrics for the, the cycling suits in a wind tunnel. They tested recovery massage gels to see which one helped their muscles recover faster. All of these tiny little improvements started to have an impact. They started to change the way people thought. They started to think about everything. You know, does it make us go faster? Yes or no? And as they worked on that, they started to get results. Not in five years, two years. In two years, they won the Tour de France. Then they won it again in 2012. They won it again in 2013. They missed 2014, but then they won it in 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. You get the idea? Huge amount of success. And again, small incremental gains working as a team toward a common goal. Then they went to the Olympics, 2008. They grabbed eight gold medals and they swept most of the medals in the Olympics. So 14 total. They also went back in 2012. Same thing. They got eight golds, 12 medals in total that year. So they're crushing it in all of the competitions. Why? David Brailsford said, well, it's because of these marginal gains. We're focused as a team on a common goal and we're doing small things every day to make ourselves a little bit better. And that adds up. David Brailsford was eventually knighted and became Sir David Brailsford. So Sir David Brailsford, all for the fact that he helped their cycling team become one of the best in the world. Now, those of you that are familiar with lean operations, lean manufacturing, you know that these small incremental gains are called Kaizen. What is Kaizen? Well, it's change for good. Kai and Zen. We change for good. We continuously improve. We're not working our people harder. He could have, David Brailsford could have gone to his team and said, hey, you know, crush it, go work hard, go, you know, go train harder, go push harder. And I'm sure there was some of that, but you can't, you just burn people out if you do that. But if you do small incremental improvements over time, you get a different result. You get a sustainable improvement that builds and eventually gets you where you need to be. So what are the steps that you can take with your team to copy David Brailsford and do what he did with your team and start getting these small incremental gains? Well, step number one is set a team goal, a big goal, a shared goal that everybody can rally around, right? Step number two, understand where you're at today. Understand well, how are we performing? What's wrong? What's broken about our current process? You know, what is the current condition of our, our performance? Then step number three, we're going to break that big goal down into small incremental goals. You can see on the screen, just there's a journey here. You're going to have ups and downs. You just have to set a next milestone because you can't get to that big goal overnight, right? You got to set like David did five years out, three years out, and then work your way toward that goal. And finally, you have to set your team loose and experiment toward hitting that goal. You got to let them try things. We got to be able to fail. We got to be able to win and learn. So all of these experiments are going to get us toward the goal. So let's go through these one at a time. Start with your team and say, what do we need to accomplish in the next three to five years? I like a three-year time frame. I like shorter time frames. Um, but just pick that big, big goal. It's got to be a goal that's so big that you can't get there just by working harder, right? If you can get there by working harder, um, you know, then, then what's the point? You, you're going to have to actually change processes. So the next question you ask is, which processes are going to have to change to get us to that goal? We may have to change the way we uh, train. We have to change the way we store our bicycles, right? You have to make fundamental process changes. One example I like of this is Southwest Airlines. They changed the industry by deciding to change their processes. They set a goal, right? They, we want to be the low-cost airlines, and we want people to love us. Their symbol is literally a heart. We want our customers to love us. So how do we do that? How do we come, become the lowest cost airlines? Well, one of the costs that we have is repairing our planes. How do you fix five different models of airplanes and keep mechanics on hand and parts on hand and all these things? They said, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to change the process fundamentally and only have one type of plane. And that one type of plane we can keep all the parts for, all the mechanics for. Great. Lower cost. Number two, most airlines have stewards and stewardesses that take care of the people boarding the plane, and then they have a cleaning crew that comes in after, you know, people that are storing the food and bringing the food on. Southwest said, hey, that seems like a lot of redundancy there. The steward and stewardesses are already on the plane. 
What if they just walked through the cabin and cleaned the plane as you went? And, and what if we even did that while people were deboarding so that we could turn the plane around faster and get wheels up, get the plane in the sky? That's how airlines make money, by the way. It's when wheels are up. So they don't want to be on the ground if they don't have to. They want to get get that plane back into service. And they did. So now the stewards and stewardesses are cleaning the plane. Then number three, how do we get great customer service? Well, what most airlines would do is when they interviewed people, they would say, you know, how many years of experience do you have? Uh, how long have you been a steward or stewardess, um, a host, you know? And, and they would look for people that had been doing it a long time. And Southwest said, you know, that doesn't really matter for us. We can teach you how to run the airplane and how to, but what we can't teach you is how to have a great personality who loves to have fun and is going to crack jokes and smile and be in a good mood. And so they changed their hiring process and they started hiring people that had that skill set. They started hiring people that could could crack a joke and could smile at people and who genuinely looked like they were having fun. And if you've ever been on a Southwest flight, I think things have toned down a little bit lately, it seems like. But, you know, 10 years ago when I was flying a lot on Southwest, man, it was just a comedy show. It's hilarious. They were always making you laugh. You always had a good time. And uh, it just felt good to be on the planes. That was because they hired people that were that, that were, had different qualities, different skills than what the other airlines were hiring for. They weren't hiring for, you know, how much experience do you have being a steward? They, they hired for... Do you love people? Do you enjoy being around people, talking to people? And that made all the difference. So we have to change our process. The next thing that we care about is understanding our current condition, right? It's difficult to change a process if you don't understand how you're performing today. So you need to evaluate yourself, do an assessment, look at your processes, get some data, right? What is the data telling us? How are we performing? If you looked at David Brailsford, you know, he knew exactly how many races they'd won. He knew the, the skill level of all of his team. He said, okay, this is our baseline. Where do we go from here? And then you can see, you know, what's the gap to our goal? How big is it? How big is this mountain we have to climb in front of us? That's the Matterhorn, by the way, my favorite mountain in the world. I spent my birthday at the bottom of the Matterhorn one year and it was, it was the greatest thing. So uh, that's the mountain I want to climb, right? And if it is, you got to know where you stand. Am I at the base of the mountain or am I all, all the way down in the valley in Zermatt and I've got a long ways to go, right? So for David Brailsford, you know, one gold, no Tour de France wins. The country's embarrassed of them. Um, that, that was something that certainly they wish that they could, uh, they could improve on. But on the positive side, he's got good people, good riders. They got good equipment. They want to win. So there's all these positive things, too, that are in the current condition. And so how do you leverage all those good things about your business to get where you want to be? You know, don't lose the good things when you're trying to improve. A lot of times when you assess yourself, you'll understand that your team really has these kind of beginning behaviors, meaning they're they're not really performing at a high level. They're performing, you know, like like somebody who's brand new in the job or brand new working as a team where they see their job as their own. They're really just trying to keep themselves and their own little person or team or area working well. They don't, they're not thinking of the bigger picture. So if you can change that, if you can switch it to where people are looking at the entire value stream, they're looking at the company as a whole and saying, okay, how do we as a company, as a team work toward this common goal? Then we can start working together. We can start looking for ways to benefit each other. And when you do that, then you create synergies. Then you create, you know, the one plus one is three where people are getting more out of the process by finding ways not just to do their job better, but to do the entire uh, job as a, as a whole, uh, how to do that better. Step number three, we have to select some next incremental goals to reach. That means, can we get 5% faster? Can we make 10% fewer mistakes? We may not get there overnight, but we can make a small change tomorrow. I strongly encourage people to do small Kaizen events, small continuous improvements where you look at some aspect of your process, say, okay, we can fix that today. These are low effort, maybe high impact, or even low effort, medium impact type of improvements. And you start knocking down one or two of those a week. And boy, pretty soon, the amount of time you free up, the amount of energy you, you save, it starts to add up. And finally, step number four, let's go experiment. Let's go work towards that goal. This is where using a Pareto chart is really helpful, identifying what the top issues are, that are getting in your way. If you don't know what a Pareto is, go over and watch the module on that. And um, the other thing you can do is leverage your team. So get your team involved in ideas. Uh, ask them, what what do you guys think we should do? The people that have been working in the process, a lot of times will have ideas of ways to make it better. Sometimes they won't, and that's okay. You bring in an industrial engineer or other people that can see the process for the first time as an outsider, 
And those folks are great too, because they can ask silly questions, say, you know, why do we do it this way? You know, why, why do you have this machine over here? Why, why is somebody having to stand here and watch this machine work when they could be doing something else? So an outsider's perspective is great. Asking the team is great. Bring, bring every resource you can to bear to try to go solve that particular problem. Why do we call it an experiment? This is really important, right? If I go to you and something went wrong in, in let's say, your area of the business, and I say, you know, what went wrong? Who, whose fault is this, right? What's that going to do? It's just going to shut people down. They're not going to want to tell you what went wrong. They're in, they're, they're going into their defensive mode and they're say, saying, you know, my boss is trying to get me in trouble and you're going to shut down any good ideas. But what if you go to your team and you say, hey, what in the process went wrong and how could we make that better? And you open them up to this idea of experimenting. Thomas, uh, or Thomas Edison, he said, I didn't fail a thousand times, right? The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. He was, was not afraid to fail. He was trying to learn. And that's what we want to do with our teams. We want to create this learning environment, this learning atmosphere where we're okay to experiment with things. I understand some of you are in highly regulated industries where you can't just experiment with some core parts of the process if you're in medical, you know, medical device manufacturing, for example. However, for most of us, we do have some freedom where we can try new things without serious consequences, and we can learn from those to see if they work better. Can we improve quality? Can we improve throughput? Can we improve safety? Can we lower costs, right? The word experiment is critical with your team. Go to your team and say, we're going to experiment. Take the pressure off of them where they don't have to get it right the first time, right? It's not mission critical. What is mission critical is trying new things and learning every day to get a little bit better. So what if you go to try and make these changes and you get resistance? What if people push back, right? People say, oh yeah, you know, we've tried this before or I've been doing this a really long time. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, what is that usually? Well, a lot of times it's just people's ego. They're afraid of losing their position at work where they feel valued, um, so you have to create a safe work environment. You have to create a place where people are free to experiment and, um, you know, start using words like, hey, we're going to experiment. Let's try something. Well, what could we learn by doing it this way? When you set a big goal, it frees people up from all these small, tiny problems that seem so important at the time. When they have a big goal they know they have to get to, it really starts to draw your team together. They start working and experimenting toward that big goal and the little things that are in their way start to fall to the sides. And you really do get a, a significant change. If you have bickering and arguing going on in your team, people kind of like not getting along, man, give them a big challenge and watch how it changes their behavior and they start to work more closely together because they need each other to reach the goal. Working toward a shared goal will bring your team closer together, eliminate many of the small problems that they have, and replace them with positive behaviors and action. So in summary, these are the four steps to reaching your goals as a team. Set that big goal, do it together, then understand where you're at, set some smaller goals to help you move forward for the next few months and years, and then start experimenting. And when you do, I am so excited to see what will happen. Your team is going to see greater success and they're gonna see it far faster than you ever thought they could. Because again, you're not trying to you know, eat the elephant in one bite. Break that elephant down into some smaller pieces and just get going, just get that momentum going. If you like this module, please go check out our website. We have a lot more trainings on lean, lean manufacturing, lean in healthcare. We have certifications your team can get. We have lots of tools your team can use. And if you need help with your continuous improvement journey, feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to help you any way we can. And with that, go forward and conquer.